Alright, let's look at verse 9 there. So verse 9 is actually where we get the name of our church. It's uh, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So the title of my message this morning is They Must Be Stopped. They Must Be Stopped. And that's what the Bible is saying here. Um, we're supposed to hold fast the faithful word um, as we've been taught. Now, some people use this if they've been brought up in a false religion. Well, we've got to say that because, uh, you know, that's what our parents taught us. And that's not true. This is what they've been taught um, by Jesus Christ and, and, of course, the apostles, you know, brought that further to other people. And why should we be holding fast the faithful word? That by sound doctrine, we will be able to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Okay? And then, so we're, we're going to go out and get people saved. Right? That's, that's the, one of the jobs of, of the church. It's one of the things that the church is here for. And, but then, also... There are many unruly and vain talkers, right? There's just people that are deceived, but then there's people that are unruly, they're vain talkers and deceivers. They're trying to deceive people into a false gospel, into a false religion. And especially they have the circumcision saying the Jews, right? They especially they want to, you know, deceive people. And there's a, a group of people that want to merge things like that, the Judaizers, right? The Hebrews Roots movement, you know, saying that you gotta be circumcised, say that you, you know, you gotta keep the feasts and so on can be poor, and what does the Bible say about people like that? Their mouths must be stopped. Because, it's, it says right up, it says right after that, uh, who subvert whole houses. What does that mean, that they're subverting whole houses? Well, I looked up the definition of subvert, and it says to overthrow something established or existing, to cause the downfall, ruin, or destruction of to undermine the principles of corrupt. So these people, they're causing the downfall. They're causing the ruin of houses. They're undermining the principles of the Bible. And that's why their mouths must be stopped. And they're teaching things which they shouldn't teach for filthy Luther's sake. They're doing it for the money. Right? People like Joel Osteen, right? However many, 40,000 people I think he has in his church, right? And yeah, you can smile because he's making the millions, right? But, I mean, he's going to burn in a hot hell, and, you know, in the, one of the lowest parts of hell, I think, anybody that preaches a false gospel. And he's undermining the principles of the Bible for money, okay, just so he can be rich. I mean, and he's not alone. He's just the first one that comes to mind. So these people, their mouths must be stopped. Their whole houses are being deceived and going over to a false religion. Now, people that are saved, they're not going to lose their salvation, right? But there's people that could have been saved. They're starting to get interested in the Bible. And then somebody that claims to teach the Bible you know, comes along. Oh, we're just like you. We're just called Mormons or we're called Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that. We just have a Bible study with you. And they subvert whole houses, right? And their mouths must be stopped. What does it mean, stopped? When we think of stop, we think of people traffic stop at a stop sign, but this is not the stop um, that that is, although that has the same effect, okay? Um, in Genesis 26, 18, the Bible says, And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. So Isaac's digging again the wells because they had plugged them up. So this stop is plugging them, right? It's like, we would take these false preachers, take a, a big old, you know, cork, take a sledgehammer and wedge that in there so it couldn't come out again, right? We're going to stop them. Not just, hey, stop. Although that's what it does, but you're plugging them up so they can't talk. Okay? Um, Hezekiah, um, in 2 Chronicles 32, 30, this same Hezekiah also stopped the utter, upper water course of Gihon, and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David, and Hezekiah prospered in all his works. So he 
plugged the river and he diverted it a different way. Okay, he stopped it. In Zechariah 7, 11, but they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Right? They're plugging their ears. So he's, I think you understand what stopped is. When the prophet, um, when, when um, Stephen, the evangelist, was speaking, right? Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon them with one accord. They plugged them. So when the Bible says whose mouths must be stopped, it's like we got to just plug them so they can't talk. Okay? And now it's not talking physically, right? We're not going to go up and find a big cork and, and do that. But there is ways to do this, okay? Whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole houses. This is verse 11. Teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said that Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. And just careful when you read this, this witness is true that that person said it. It's not true that all the Christians are liars. Okay? This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Okay? Now there's, there's this attitude among Christianity, right? Is that we got to get along with everybody. Everybody be your friend. doesn't matter if they're Catholic or if they're Mormon. doesn't matter. Well, no. Okay? The Bible says rebuke them sharply. Now, this is advice from Paul to a preacher, right? This is uh, one of the pastoral epistles. And he's talking to Titus how he should preach, right? He says, rebuke them sharply. He doesn't just, oh, you know, it's not the best thing that we should do. You know, brother. Uh, no, he says, rebuke them sharply. Call them out for what they are. Tell them, you're a false prophet. Quit doing that. to send people to hell. Rebuke them sharply. But people have this false idea, they've got this false God in their mind, that He's just a God of love. But the thing is, He cannot be just a God of love if He's not also just. Right? If He doesn't punish the wicked, doesn't punish the evildoers, He's not a loving God. Or if He doesn't punish the people that are hurting children, and good thing we have a loving God that does rebuke people, and He does punish people. So, wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. See, some churches, and I mean, I'm not going to paint it with a broad brush. It's not all of the old IFB. But some of the old IFB, they will bring in Jews, right? Oh, let's learn from them about the, you know, the Passover and these different things in the Old Testament. No, we shouldn't even have them come in. We should rebuke them sharply because they're teaching a false Gospel, or they're not even pre preaching a gospel, well, a, a false way to heaven, right? Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate, right? These false prophets, they're reprobates. Like obviously, everybody that's in a Catholic church isn't a reprobate. It's the, the, the leadership that, 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 that is teaching these false gospels. And this isn't just a New Testament thing. In the Old Testament, in, in Psalm 63, verse 11, it says, But the king shall rejoice in God. Every one that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, this is the opposite of what we'll probably hear in most churches, right? They won't, because they, want, they don't want to offend anybody, right? They don't want to get any negative attention and, oh, we'll just love everybody, right? It doesn't matter if they're sending people to hell, we should still love them. No, okay? Not if they're God's enemies. And we can love people and still rebuke them sharply. In fact, you can rebuke somebody sharply because you love them, right? It's like if, you're, if, you're, if your little child is reaching for the element on the oven, you say, no, it's not. No, Johnny, I don't think that's the best thing for you to do, right? No, you have to boot them sharp because it's urgent. You don't want them to burn themselves. And it's urgent that people, lost souls do not get burned in hell. Because once they die, it's too late. No matter if people believe in the reprobate doctrine or not, there comes a time when it's too late for people. And for most people, it's when they die. Okay. But for false prophets, it, you know, 
you know, they reject God and reject God and reject God. Eventually, God just rejects them. Second Timothy 3, let's start there in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Okay, we need to turn away from these people, right? They're, they're, they're all these, this list of things that the Bible says they are, right? Weird, wicked, the, you know, truth speakers, false accusers, all these different things, despisers of those that are good. They hate Christians, right? And we're supposed to turn away from them. But the thing is, they have a form of godliness. They name the name of Jesus. They use something they call a Bible. And some of them actually use the King James Version Bible, right? But we're supposed to turn away from them. And if, But if you don't know that they're deceivers, how are you going to turn away from them? So it's a preacher's job, it's a pastor's job to let you know and warn you about them so you can turn away. It's not, oh, well, this guy is teaching something good about the King James Version Bible, so he must be legit. You start listening to him on the internet, not realizing... That Sam Gipp believes in hyper-dispensationalism, right? That there's four different ways that a person could get saved in different periods of time. And the Bible uh, has taught always that it's whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Look at um, Acts 10, uh, I think it's 1043, where it says, uh, To him give all the prophets witness, right? That, that whoever believes on him will receive remission of sins, right? And that's not quoted accurately. So they, they have a form of godliness, but they are not godly. They deny the power they have, right? And in some of these churches, they're more interested in church history and, you know, how the Catholic Church started and the Reformation, all these different things. And they want to, you know, they're more concerned about all the, the, you know, the fancy Bible terms rather than actually the meat of the Word, right? It's like, they don't care if in one Bible version they use directly contradicts another one. They don't care. They think it's all the Word of God. I and mean, it can't be. Right? And so they have a form of godliness, right? They'll pray, they'll use spiritual terms, but they deny the power thereof, and we should turn away for, from them. In verse 6 there, it says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Right? There's a reason why God made the man the head of the house, right? Because the women are more easily deceived. I mean, Eve got deceived into eating of the tree that she should not have eaten, right? And so here are these, these silly women, they're, they're easily persuaded. The Jehovah's Witness comes to their door, or the Mormons come to their door. Oh, let's just have a Bible study. Oh, well, come in, I'll get you some tea, and, and we'll talk about it. And they don't realize that we should not even bid them Godspeed. We should not even you know, allow them into our house, okay? And like it said before, they're subverting whole houses and they're creeping into houses, they're leading captive silly women, laden with sins and led away with diverse lusts, okay? And guy, this can happen to guys too. I'm just making an example that it's easier in some cases for women to get deceived than men. Now look at verse seven, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's not like these people that are reprobates stop learning, right? They're learning. They're, they, you know, they want to maybe learn what the Greek says and learn what the Hebrew says. They're always learning and, and oh, well, this conference of this Catholic group and, 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 and you know, this teacher of uh, Calvinism or whatever. They're learning all these different things. They're ever learning, but they never come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because they deny the power thereof and eventually God rejects them. Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of crept minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Right? Their foolishness, folly is foolishness, will be known unto all men. May manifest, it means to make known. Okay? And I think that is one of the jobs of a pastor is to warn his flock. Okay? We don't want 
Yes. And, and now they don't even have to physically come into your house. They can come into your house through the internet, right? They can, oh, well, this person sings pretty. You know, you can't be all wicked. Or this person said something clever, right? And you start listening to uh, these people that are have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Men of corrupt minds, the Bible calls them, reprobate concerning the faith. Their, their miles must be stopped. And especially people that, that want to get along with everybody, and we want to be nice, you think, well, that's being me, right? And, and I had a conversation with, um, who used to be, I uh, thought, a, a pretty good friend, but I had to rebuke him sharply because he, he thought personal holiness was involved with salvation, right? And, and I, don't think he's, I don't think he's a reprobate, right? But, I mean, is it more loving to just let him think he's going to heaven, or is it more loving to say, no, you're on your way to hell if you believe this, right? But these false teachers, we don't rebuke them for just the sake of, you know, trying to take down some wicked guy just because we hate them. It's because we don't want them to subvert old houses. We want to warn people about these people. And one of the reasons I'm preaching this is I want to start going through, and it's not going to be like a series that's in every single Sunday, but periodically I want to go through different religions and, and uh, show you um, how they stack up with the Bible. Now if you flip over to the next chapter there, um, chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This is the instructions of Paul to Timothy, right? He's saying... You're supposed to preach the word when it's popular and when it's not popular, right? And what and what is less popular than you know condemning the faggots when pretty soon everybody will have extended family that, that that's uh, you know sodomites, right? Is that your talk now starts to become personal, right? Especially if you like that person. But the Bible says not just to preach when it's popular, you've got to preach when it is not popular. And not just say it in a nice way, sometimes you've got to rebuke and exhort, right? With, with all long suffering and doctrine. You do it out of love, and, but you've got to rebuke them. Rebuke them sharply, the Bible says. Okay? The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall and shall be turned on to fables. You may think, well, why is Jim preaching this? We already know this. We're not going to go and listen to John MacArthur or or somebody like that on the on the internet. Yeah, but what about all these young children? You know that, but do they know that? Right? Eventually, they might just. Oh yeah, my parents went to church. Right? Especially if all of a sudden you would get out of church. It's like, well, I want to start listening to it. You know, what this guy says makes sense. And not reading the Bible for themselves, they could be subverted. Paul says in his epistle to the Romans, he says in Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Now notice he doesn't say, mark them just which causes divisions. It has to be divisions contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. Now if somebody, some preacher comes in and he starts preaching hard and it's causing division in the church, but what he says is biblical, this is not mark them and avoid them. Right? This is a person that's got some guts. Okay? Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ with their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Right? We're rebuking these people because we want the simple to be where? Okay? If you if you don't mark them and, and avoid them, it's like how do they know if, if they're if they're alright or not? And notice they're, they're using good words and fair speeches. You can reason with logic or you know, because of this, and this is the case. And they can go down some rabbit trail and they're, they're, they have a flawed assumption right to be beginning or some, somewhere else. Right? It's not like they don't know how to talk. I can almost guarantee you they can, they can talk you know, with, with a better speech than I can. But they're using false words. They're not using the scripture. 
They're just reasoning things out of their own heart. Paul did this. He didn't just preach it. He, he practiced it, right? And if you're still there in 2 Timothy, look at verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. He's calling out somebody by name. Right? Some people kind of bristle when you start calling out the names. Especially if, if it was somebody that you knew. Let's say eventually there, there it creeps in a false prophet among us, right? And let's say like what happened in other churches is somebody that denies the Trinity and we've got to rebuke it from the pulpit. But your wife was friends with their wife and, and you don't like that and your feelings get hurt. You know what? The name still has to be named. Okay. I mean, this coppersmith did Paul evil and, and he calls him up by name. Whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it, be not, that it may not be laid to their church. So he is naming the name, and then like everybody in the church is just like going on the side of Alexander. Alexander probably had a convincing argument. He probably had some fair words and fair speeches, and he deceived some hearts, Right? But the good thing is, Paul says it was at the first, right? Everybody, their first thought is to side with these people. Paul's just being mean again, right? And he wasn't, okay? So, but the good thing is, and for Paul, for his sake, he wasn't alone, right? Look, verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Everybody else was forsaking him. At first answer, no man stood with him, but the Lord stood with him. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that... By, my, by me, the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So shouldn't we just get along with everybody, right? Um, and not argue with people? Well, what does the Bible say about that, right? Because uh, that, a lot of brands of Christianity, that's what they teach, right? We should get along with everybody at all costs, just agree to what they say, and right, there's varying degrees, right? Not everybody says, just agree with everything they say, just be nice. Don't say anything offensive. Don't talk about things that might trigger somebody, right? And, and I agree. If we're at the door, right, and, and, and we're, oh, I'm Catholic. You don't just start going off on how they worship idols and, and Mother Mary right off the hop, right? You, you ask if you could preach the gospel and what the Bible says. Now, you've got to mention that you've got to repent of your worshiping idols, right? You've got to repent of your faith in Mary, right? And then you've got to place all your faith on Jesus Christ. Okay, you have to mention that. But we don't just go, oh, your church, church is stupid that you want to, right? We don't just pick a fight, right? We, we let our speech be seasoned with, uh, always with grace and seasoned with salt, right? We have grace, we give them more uh, slack than they deserve, but we also have salt in there, though, that, that they'll get some flavor. So what does the Bible say? Should we never argue with anybody? Well, look at 2 Timothy 2.14. 2 Timothy 2.14 Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not of the words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now if you just casually glance over that, you say, see, it says you should not argue with people. Right? What is striving? It's arguing with people. And it's also um, seeking to, to, to attain a goal, right? You're striving for the finish line. But here it says, that Timothy is supposed to charge them before the Lord that they don't strive. Right? But it doesn't say just don't strive. He says that they strive not about words to no profit. So don't argue about things that doesn't have any profit. But do argue to the subverting of the hearer. Right? You want people to get saved. So it's not like, well, I believe that uh, you can lose your salvation. Oh, if that's what you believe, that's, you know, you just leave it alone. No. It's not you don't strive at all, it's just you strive to subverting of the hearers. Not about words to no profit, right? Oh, well you think the and you get derailed and oh you think that we're out of here before the tribulation? Well, are you in for a surprise, right? No. We don't worry. We're out there to preach the gospel. But from the pulpit, that's where we get the hard preaching. That's where we we nail them to the wall and put the nails in their coffin and 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 mark them and avoid them so that none of us, including the young children, and you think, well, the young children, especially like really young children, some of them even have a soother in their mouth, right? They hear more and they understand more than you give them credit for, okay? 
So it does not say don't strive at all. It doesn't say don't argue at all. Just don't argue with no profit in it, right? Because sometimes you reach, you find a door and it's like you almost instantly know they just want to argue with you, right? Hebrew roots people are famous for this, right? Or those black Israel, uh, I was thinking the black Israelites, right? Black Hebrew Israelites, they think they're the is Israel of the Bible, right? And they just want to argue about, about it, right? And so it's, it's not profitable to argue with people like that. But if, if, if you can convince them of the gospel, that's where you do want to argue. And, and, and when I say argue, I don't mean like, like a knockdown, drag out kind of fight. I'm just saying you, you're going to disagree with them and you show them where they're wrong from the Bible. Verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So here again, he's naming names, right? And he's saying their word eats like a canker. And I think that's a canker worm. And it, it, it just, it, it'll destroy vegetation, right? And their word does the same thing, right? It sows doubt, just like the devil's word uh, sowed doubt with great, great, great grandma Eve, right? Ye hath God said. Did he really say that? Is that what that really means? Right? They'll, they'll cast some doubt on, on the word and it, it's a cancer. Right? And churches can be eaten by cancer. And it has to be rebuked sharply and you can't let it fester. Right? It's like a rotten apple and a whole barrel full of apples. Pretty soon the whole barrel is rotten. So he names this Hymenaeus and Philetus, look at verse 18, who concerning the truth have heard, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. They're saying, well, it's already all happened, right? They're saying the resurrection, they're, pre they're preterists, right? They're saying everything has already happened, in, you know, in, in the prophecies, right? The, the, the first resurrection has already happened. You know, the dead in Christ already rose and... The resurrection has happened. And then some people's faith. Notice it says some. Overthrowing the faith of some. Because the people that are actually saved. They're, they're probably not going to get deceived with this. Okay. But there's, there would be some people that maybe aren't saved. But they're starting to believe things. And then they just. Oh the resurrection has passed. But I mean. People that are saved. Can still Their faith of that Jesus is still coming back. Could. They could throw them for a loop, right? They might start thinking something else about the rapture. And Paul says, shun profane and vain babblings. Um, and anyway, just for sake of time, we'll drop down to verse 21. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Right? He's telling Timothy, like, get rid of these people in the church, these troublemakers, these cancer-causing uh, false preachers in the church. Right? I mean, some of them, you just need to rebuke them sharply and they'll, they can get right. Right? If they're saved, for sure, right? they can get right by the Word of God. Now, some people still, um, they, they quench the Spirit. They don't want to listen to what the Holy Spirit's telling them. It's like, no, I learned this in Bible school. What you're saying can't be right. When... The Bible is the authority, not what you learned in Bible school. Verse 23 says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender stripes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And you say, well, doesn't that contradict what you said? No. This... I believe this is talking about people in the church, right? You're not just going to throw the whole book at them. You're going to talk to them in meekness and try to instruct them, right? So that they, God will hopefully give them repentance and they will get right on whatever doctrine. Right? We don't want to just alienate people because they don't believe exactly like we do. We do it out of love. But people outside? Like, when I'm rebuking a false prophet, whatever their name is, right? I don't really care about doing it in love. For them, right? Because I don't love them. They're God's enemies. I don't love them. But I do it out of love to the people that could be under the sound of their voice. Right? Because it, it did say in Titus 1.13, This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they be sound, may be sound in the faith. This is not a contradiction, right? People in the church, you treat differently than false teachers. People at the door, you 
t uh, treat differently than a false prophet, right? The leader of a religion. Right? There's a lot of de deception out there, right? And in, in Ephesians 5, 6, it says, Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the, in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And listen to this. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Right? What's reprove? It's correcting them. It's telling them they're wrong. Right? If you never tell your children that they're wrong because you don't want to hurt their feelings, right? You're into this uh, positive only parenting. Right? They're not gonna they're not gonna learn. Right? They're not gonna learn as well. They'll learn some things, but you gotta reprove them. And same thing with false teachers, right? You not only reprove them, you rebuke them. Reprove is just telling somebody they're wrong. And telling them what is the right way. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. You shine that spotlight. I got a new flashlight and I kind of really like it. 1900 lumens for those of you that know anything with flashlights. I'm a little bit of a flashlight geek. But, because for years I always carried a flashlight, right? And for a while I, I had a flash that didn't work, so I haven't, and, and of course with my vision and being an inspector and stuff, I gotta see stuff, right? Um, and so this is what we're doing. We're shining the light on these false prophets so everybody can see he's got no legs to stand on. He's just, he's got no case. And then their mouths are stopped because like, uh, 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 right? they cannot gainsay nor resist the right words. I mean, they try, but they cannot, right? If you shine the light so everybody can see their foolishness, they're reproved and they're uh, made manifest by the light. The Bible says in Proverbs 19.25, Smite a scorner, and the simple will beware. And reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. Smite, that's like whack them one, right? And, well, we're not going to smite them physically, right? Smite a scorner. Some say, oh, you think you can just do whatever you want and still go to heaven? Well, you smite them with the word of God. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean... Look at this verse, look at this verse. Shall not come into condemnation, right? Um, not of works as any man should boast. Not of works of righteousness. Um, right, uh, all these different verses. It's not of ourselves, but it's the gift of God. All these things that we can smite them with. And you might not get that person, right? They scorner, but what scorners like to scorn in front of other people, so then the other people can understand, right? Sometimes even at the door, it's like, well, you think you can do whatever you want? And you give them a verse and he doesn't want to listen to it, but maybe the little boy or the little girl that was there heard that, and sometime later when their soul wonder comes back, they can get, get those children, right? You know, people accuse us, and by us I mean churches like ours that, that preach hard on sin, that, 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 that don't care about men, mentioning names, that, that we're mean, right? And, and then we were hateful and we have a mean spirit, right? But they need to read the Bible. What, what, is, what is their fruit like, right? The Bible says you can know somebody by their fruit, but not just anybody. People want to twist us and say you can tell everybody by their fruit, right? If you don't have the fruit, you're not saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. It says you can know a prophet by their fruit. In Matthew 7, starting verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Right? Is Joel Osteen a really nice guy? Well, he sure smiles a lot, right? He has nice, nice teeth and all that. But what does that have to do with the gospel, right? Does he go out soul winning? Well, he doesn't have to. He's got a television program or whatever, and he gets people saved out. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He's, he teaches people covetousness and for his own filthy lucre's sake. Shall know them by their fruits, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, 
but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. I'll say that again. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Right? If this is false preaching that these people, these churches like ours are doing, right? And when they're rebuking false prophets, they would not have good fruit. You, a, a, a bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit. So you, you go to these churches and they do soul winning. They do soul winning, right? And you go ask one of their converts, what do you think it takes to go to heaven? And they give you the right answer from the Word of God, right? It's either they didn't get saved at that church, if that church is a false church, or they did, and that's the fruit of their church. And if they have good fruit, they're not a bad church, okay? You cannot get good fruit from a bad tree. It does not work. An unsaved person cannot get a person saved. A false Bible version, a, a, a corrupted word of God cannot get somebody saved. Now, if there's a verse in there that hasn't changed, right? It still says the same thing about salvation. Well, it's just altogether it's poison, but that one verse could, you know, um, show somebody the gospel. But as a whole, that, that their books are garbage and should be burned okay? because there's poison in there. So a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, for for by their fruits ye shall know them. Okay, so we, we know that we got to tell everybody about the warn people in our church about false prophets. We've got to mark them and, and avoid them. We've got to shine the light on them so everybody can see how stupid their argument is. But how do we stop them? Well, exactly that, by the Word of God. There's an example in Ezekiel 11, right? There's people that are preaching false things in Ezekiel 11, verse 1. And if you want, you can go there, but I'm going to start reading. And we're just about done here. It says in Ezekiel 11 verse 1, and I'm just going to kind of skip through this um, story for sake of time. But in verse 1 it says, Moreover the Spirit lifted me up and brought me onto the east gate of the Lord's house, which look at the eastward, and behold at the door of the gate five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jeazaniah the son of Azur, and Pelatiah the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. And look at verse 2, what these people were doing. And said unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in the city. So they're devising mischief, which is not good, but they're giving wicked counsel. What's counsel? It's advice. They're giving wicked advice. These are false teachers. What are they saying? Well, look at verse 3. Which say, it is not near. Let us fill the houses. This city is a cauldron. We be the flesh. Okay? They're saying, Our, Jerusalem's destruction isn't near. They're telling everybody, you're okay, right? Prosperity preaching. God's not mad at you. And they're teaching false things. But what does God say uh, to Ezekiel? Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy with son of man. But he doesn't say, oh, don't hurt their feelings. Be nice. He just says, prophesy to them. Against them. Right? Not necessarily to them, but so everybody else will be aware. But against them too, you're rebuking them. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. Thus have you said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Actually, I'm just going to read it here. You have multiplied your slain in the city, and you have filled the streets there with the slain. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Your slain, whom you have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh. The city is the cauldron, but I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. He, yes, they are going to come. They are going to take people captive and take you out of the city. You have feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, saith the Lord God. And I will bring you out of the midst thereof. And then I'm going to skip ahead. So he's preaching to them. What you say isn't going to happen is going to happen. God's going to destroy the city. He's going to take captive. The, the enemy's going to take captive. And it will happen. And it's not going to happen like you say. And look at verse 13. What happens when he preaches against them? And it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. Then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, oh Lord God, will thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? This, 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 this didn't sit well with Ezekiel, but God made the one false prophet just die when he started preaching. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen when we used to rebuke a false prophet, but God did this as an example to the other 24 guys and to the other people that would, were listening to these people. And once Ezekiel starts preaching, they die. Right? They may not physically die, but your argument can die. 
right? Or at least people will be turned away from the wickedness and believe the truth. So this whole idea of ecumenicalism and oh, all these branches of Christianity should just get together. We're not that different. We all name the name of Christ. And we shouldn't rebuke each other. We shouldn't say bad things about uh, each other. It's false. Okay? The Bible says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate. Say it the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. We're not supposed to have any concord with Belial. Right? We're not supposed to be unequally yoked with these people. Instead, the Bible teaches we should rebuke them, we should mark them, we should avoid them, we should smite the scorners so that the simple can be aware. And Jehu got, um, I'm sorry, Jehu the prophet told Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, he says, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Right? Should we support John MacArthur just because he spoke out about the government ch shutting churches down? No, we shouldn't. He's a false prophet. He believes a false gospel. And he's popular on the internet. He's teaching other people a false gospel. And he's sending many people to hell. We should rather rebuke him, reprove him, shine the light on him so everybody can see he's a false prophet. Because Jehoshaphat was helping a, a, a wicked king in Israel, and he and he got told by a prophet, "Shouldest thou help the ungodly, love them that hate the Lord? Therefore, as wrath." Upon thee from before the Lord. If we help these people, I don't care if you, you help them because you think, well, it's good that, that he's anti shut down the church, which is a good thing, but we should not be yoked together with him, right? Or this, this pastor in Calgary that got sent to prison because he refused to shut down his church, right? It was probably good that he refused to shut down his church, but we should not support him because he teaches false things. Okay, or, te or support somebody because they, they teach a lot of things, the same things as you, but they believe in repenting of your sins. That's wicked. Okay, you should not support people that teach repent of your sins. We should not do that, right? We should not support, you know, David Cloud because he he's a Baptist. No, he believes in repent of your sins to be saved. We should rather rebuke them. We're not just going to get along with people because we want to be nice people. If we're nice people, we're going to warn people about people that are teaching people how to go to hell and think they're going to heaven. Because wrath will be on us if we'll, we'll help the ungodly. And I don't want God to be mad at me. I do enough stupid things and, and, and wicked things that, that God can be upset about. I want to please God and I definitely don't want to help the ungodly. Right? And there's good pastors that have gotten mixed up on this. I was... I didn't, wasn't going to mention this, but like somebody like Stacy Shiflin, right? Preaches repent of your sins to be saved. And I like Pastor McMurtry, but he should not be supporting him, right? Because he, he teaches a false gospel. We can be too nice. We can be nicer than the Bible, and we should not do that, right? You don't want wrath upon us because we love them that hate the Lord. So let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, God, for your word. And help us to love it no matter what, who hurts their feelings or offends them. Help us to be nice people when we can, but help us also reprove people and rebuke people when we should, and not uh, shy away from them. Especially help me and any other preacher to uh, shine a light on, on wickedness and make it manifest so other people can be aware. Please bless this church, bless this congregation, help us get many people saved in the rest of this year and the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.